corner here on Annunciation Radio on our family of stations, WNOC 89.7 in the greater Toledo area, WHRQ 88.1 in Sandusky, 89.5 WFOT in Mansfield, 90.9 WSHB in Willard, 89.9 WRRO in Bryan, and our newest affiliate, 104.1 WLBJ in Faustoria. Uh, plus, there are several other stations that carry the Bishop's Corner, 88.9 WJTA in Lipsick, and 103.3 WSJG in Tiffin. Uh, the Bishop's Corner is heard every Thursday night and rebroadcast several times throughout each weekend. You can check that broadcast schedule at the Annunciation Radio website, which is www.annunciationradio.com. And, of course, Bishop, we also want to welcome, in addition to our radio listeners, our viewers online. You know, they're always out there looking at us now. I'm delighted. They're li looking and they're listening, Looking Ron. and listening. That's, That's great. Right. And folks, uh, I know you know who this is. We have Bishop Thomas here with us as always. Greetings, and, everyone. It's so nice to be with you again. Yeah, welcome you to the show. And as always, I see you have all kinds of notes and all kinds of things, so you must have a lot on your mind you want to talk about. Well, I guess one of the first things, Ron, we were just mentioning before going on air was the Feast of the Ascension, Yes. which, of course, is this past Sunday that we're celebrating on Sunday. And it's a little bit uh, discombobulating, as my dad used to say for yeah. me, Ron, because our listeners should know that when, you know, until I came to Ohio, the ecclesiastical provinces nearby my home in Philadelphia mm -hmm. all celebrated the Ascension on Thursday. So, if you will, Ascension Thursday was on Thursday. On Thursday. <laughs> Who would have thought? So, I can't imagine. I know some of our listeners are a little confused by that. Yeah. And uh, I hope you know, listeners, I am too. Yeah. So, so, it's a little bit of a shift for me to now celebrate the Ascension on Sunday. And in a way, a little tinge of sadness, Ron, because I'll celebrate uh, 31 years of priesthood this year. And my first Mass was on, of course, a Sunday after being ordained on Saturday. And it was on the liturgical celebration hmm. of the seventh Sunday of Easter. Hmm. So now that I live in Ohio, I will never again celebrate the liturgical observation <laughs> of the seventh Sunday of Easter. So I guess I just have to transfer the joy to the Ascension. What, what's the background to that? Why was it changed? Well, the bishops were given the capacity to vote by province, provincial region, as to what they felt would be most advantageous for the pastoral care of their people, including yeah. how many people would be able to gather on Thursday oh, okay. to celebrate Ascension Thursday. So uh, right now, we know that, for example, I think it's uh, Boston, Philadelphia, Newark, New York, Omaha, though all those provincial regions celebrated on Thursday, but all the rest throughout the United States celebrate on Sunday. Changed it. They've oh. transferred the feast to Sunday. Oh, okay, good. All right. So what folks, else? here we are in the light of the Ascension. Yeah. What else is on your mind? Uh, well, uh, one thing that's very, very important is to mention the upcoming feast, of course, of Pentecost and the gift of grace that will come to us this coming weekend, which will be the ordination of one of our seminarians to the transitional diaconate, Tony Cosi. And I'll have the joy of celebrating his ordination on the 14th of May, which is the Feast of St. Matthias, uh -huh. which will be wonderful. The apostle chosen, remember, to take the place of Judas. So I already told Tony he's not being taken. <laughs> he's not being chosen to take the place of Judas, but he's been chosen to stand in the person of Jesus, the servant, as a transitional deacon, and then please God within a year to be ordained a priest. And Tony is at... Cincinnati, right? That's right. He's at, at Mount St. Mary's of the West, right. uh, otherwise known as the Athenaeum, where right. I had the joy of visiting not too long ago, and he's con continuing his studies there for the priesthood. So when you see young gentlemen coming in, young guys coming in, that has to be so gratifying for a bishop, right? It's a joy. I uh, wish I had more than one to, well, to ordain sure, this year, Ron. I'm sure you do. But I'm encouraged because in these Andrew dinners that we have that the vocation office, yeah. you know, uh, puts on... We uh, had one not too long ago. Didn't I, I just saw a picture on your Facebook page. That's exactly right. Yeah. And once again, we had about 28 a young men. A lot of young men. And by God's grace, yeah. again, it's just young men who express an openness. So sure. it's not a commitment. So it's not These a decision. Be high school? That was high school and early college age. Oh, okay. Right. So we have you know this program of Andrew Dinners, and it, it really is left to the priests who are so good at inviting young men from their parishes okay. just to come and consider the possibility. So I was delighted we had 28, and we have to pray that maybe some of those men will be inspired to How long have enter. they been doing this? Do you know? 
I, here I, in the stars. I don't know the answer okay. to that. I've only been here a year and a half. Yeah, huh? you wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't All right. Anything else on your mind? I think or we need to get gospel? to the gospel, to or the we gospel. won't get to the people's questions. Yeah, right? there we go. That's a good point. All right. Well, we are going to read from uh, the Ascension Thursday's gospel, which from... is Ascension Sunday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but now I'm confused. <laughs> from Luke. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witness of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, raised his hands, and blessed them. As he blessed them, he parted from them and was taken up to heaven. They did him homage and then returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. First thoughts, Bishop. So, Ron, we also know that the Lord ascended to heaven before the Spirit could be sent by Jesus and the Father. And so that's why Jesus hmm. tells them, he says, remain in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. That clothing is would the be the, the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. I think in this gospel, one of the most significant words is a word that I've preached about so often at confirmation time, and I think is one of the words that is so critical for us today, and that is, you are witnesses of these things. And so those disciples who gathered around the Lord Jesus, risen from the dead and about to ascend to heaven, they were told, you are witnesses of mm. all that I've done. And he's telling us the very same thing. So in our daily lives and for our listeners, no matter what our work, no matter what our vocation, we are his witnesses now. So we are witnesses mm. of the things that he did, that he said, that he spoke. We are witnesses of the act of his passion, death, and resurrection. And now we are witnesses wherever we are to that glory. And so we're witnesses mm. of the risen Easter Christ. And that's the charge that the ascension gives us even as we await a new outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. Yeah, wonderful. All right, well, Bishop, thank you for that reflection. We're going to sneak one question in here before we go to our break, and it's from John at Holy Angels in Sandusky, who says, I have a question for Bishop Thomas. Uh, some people are planning on taking a group of people on an extended bus trip. Uh, they want to be home by 6 o'clock Sunday, p.m. Sunday, but this would require us to leave early before any morning mass at the church in the city we are visiting. Can we get a dispensation from our pastor to relieve us the requirement of our Sunday obligation? Thanks, John. Thank you, John, for the thoughtful question. I hope you know I won't quote canon law, but I hope that people will trust me. No one can give a dispensation from the requirement of the Sunday obligation because that obligation is given to us by the Lord. So our Lord invites us to make holy the Lord's day. Now, wait a minute. You can't give a dispensation? No, because it's the Lord's day. I've always heard that that happens. No, even in the case of bad weather, for example, it's the people who make the judgment that they can't come to Mass because otherwise, for example, if there's, what is it, a level three here yeah. where yeah. police say you can all... So that's not a dispensation from the obligation. It's the prudential judgment that I don't want to break the law and go to Sunday Mass. Now, before and I, was, I would still confess before, that I didn't get to Sunday Mass. Before I was Catholic, I was told you could do that. Well, I, I don't know who told you that, well, Ryan. I don't know. You, you I better don't know go back. <laughs> so I guess, John, <laughs> one thing you mentioned here, uh, people are going on a trip. That's an extended trip. That's a bus trip. They want to be home by 6 p.m. Sunday, but that would require leaving very early before any morning Mass on Sunday in the church of the city we're visiting. Well, John, my answer to that is, what about the Saturday Vigil Mass? So I, I, I always ask, John, when people ask these questions, has every possible avenue to be faithful to the church and the Lord's requirement of attending the Sunday Eucharist, has every avenue been exhausted? Like, for example, they could get home at 8 o'clock Sunday night. Well, that's exactly my question. <laughs> so, and it says they want to yeah. be home by 6 p.m. Sunday. So really, John, the question is, what's the first good? And if the yeah. first good and desire is, I want to be a faithful Catholic, I want to follow the teaching of the church, and I want to attend Sunday Mass and receive the Holy Eucharist, then maybe making that happen Saturday evening or getting home a little later 
in an inconvenienced way, the more important thing is Sunday Mass. Yeah. So I would invite, John, those people who are going on that trip w to ask themselves the question as Catholics, what's more important, Sunday Mass or the comfort of getting, getting home earlier? Yeah. You know, when, um, uh, when I was younger and, and one of my sons was younger, he was a, a kind of a national level athlete and we traveled the country for years and years and years. And he played his sport he was in, he played matches that were all kinds of times I'm all sure. over and were scheduled where we had no control. And I can remember weekend after weekend after weekend having to just figure out how, how to get to mass. To get to mass, how Beautiful. to make that work. And sometimes it's really challenging, but as you just said, you have to look at the first good and, and where your priority has to be. And, and, and I see it uh, uh, in our area, out in the uh, Port Clinton Sandusky area. Uh, it's a big vacation area. Sure. And I am always amazed at Mass. How many people are there? All the vacationers there. Now they may be there in their shorts and their flip flops, <laughs> which is another. <laughs> but thing I think to talk that's about. something we should reiterate for John, you know. and that is, John, the singular question is, as Catholics, what is their priority? Yeah. Is their priority yeah. getting home early, or is their priority getting to mass on the weekend? Yeah, yeah. But it's a great question. It's man. beautiful, and yeah. I would invite them, John. Invite those people. What's the priority? And I would invite them to make every effort to Sunday Mass and the Holy Eucharist. All right, great. Well, thank you, Bishop. Thanks for that question, John. Uh, folks, we do have to take a quick break, so uh, don't go anywhere. The Bishop will be right back here to answer your questions. Stay right where you're at. Christian Radio, and we're with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Uh, folks, uh, the Bishop is always anxious to get your questions. There are several ways you can do that. You can send him a, uh, an email directly to bishop at annunciationradio.com. Or you can simply just get on the internet, uh, Google Bishop's Corner, click on it, and a little template will pop up. You can put your question in there. Uh, the bishop uh, would uh, like you to give him maybe your first name or the town you're from or the parish you're from or the station you're listening to, something that will help identify uh, yourself so can he knows who he's speaking with. Uh, we do our very, very best to get all the questions on the air. Sometimes we have too many and we have to edit them down a little bit. But uh, if you we're can get them in, Ron, we're going to we, <laughs> we do everything we can to get them in. So we're going to go to Mary Pat in Walbridge, who says, Dear Bishop, I heard about the annual Andrew dinner held recently. We just talked about yes, this. We did we? and was wondering what other activities or events for encouraging vocations are planned by the diocese. How are we doing on vocations in our area, and how does it compare with other regions? Thanks, Mary Pat. First, thanks to Mary Pat and all our listeners who are concerned about and pray for vocations. As you all know, folks, my, my great theme for the diocese is holy disciples, holy families, holy vocations. And so vocations to the diocesan priesthood are a major priority for us. And Mary Pat, just to note, the Andrew dinners are not just annually, not just once a year, but actually multiple times a year. Yeah. So we have about three or four Andrew dinners for young men who might be open and interested to diocesan priesthood in different parts of the diocese. Again, trying to reach all of our 19 counties, our 15 yeah. deaneries. And there are multiple other events and activities that take place through the year. And that includes, obviously, the, especially the week of prayer for vocations which is in the fall, which we'll honor again. And we usually do a Eucharistic Holy Hour and try to have that in every parish for vocations. And multiple other activities, which you could find, uh, Mary Pat, on our website and under the vocations office. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing on vocations? Last year, we accepted two young men to study for the priesthood. And this year, Mary Pat, we have, I know at this moment, we have three young men who are accepted and at least two as... Monsignor Singler, our vocation director, likes to say, who are in the pipeline, in the pipeline, who are on track, please God, to be accepted. So, Mary Pat, we will have more than doubled our new seminaries from last year. But yeah. that also means that that does not fulfill who we need because, Ron, we could, we could take 10 to 20 to 30 seminarians a year and still not fulfill all our needs. So we need many, many new vocations. You know, and Pat's uh, question is a great question, what's the diocese doing? But I would say that... Sometimes I wonder if it's not really more what all of us should be doing as opposed to what the diocese is doing. I, 
I can point to a lot of young men that will say that it was really someone, a lay person, who initially said to them, have you ever considered this? Hey, I think you might make a good priest. Absolutely. Um, whether that's a teacher or whether it's someone in a your coach. parish, a coach. Sure. Or someone that you see. When, when, when all of us see young men that we think look like they have the qualities to be a priest, the key is, is just that it opens them up to the option of it. You don't That's have right. to sell it to them. You don't have to push it on them. That's right. But they, it should be an option for a talented young man, no different than being a teacher or a plumber or And I think it plants a else. seed, and doesn't you it? plant a seed. That's exactly. right. And then if the Holy Spirit desires, then that seed Absolutely. is nurtured and grows. And so I think, Mary Pat, that's a wonderful suggestion from Ron, and I was going to make it. So thank you, Ron, yeah. for prompting that suggestion to invite you and all our listeners to not only pray for vocations intensely, for priestly vocations, of course, but to identify them. So if in your parish or your office or in your parish setting, your school, if there are some men who you see the possible qualities of a possible priest, please don't hesitate to say, gee, you might, you, I think you have all those qualities. Yeah. Have you thought of becoming a Catholic priest? Yeah, good. I think all it's right. a wonderful thing. Great question, Mary Pat. Uh, we're gonna go to Robert in Toledo. Uh, dear Bishop Thomas, our pastor in the past openly participated in a, quote, pulpit exchange. He visited a Presbyterian service and gave a homily while their minister gave a talk at our Mass. I wasn't offended by this, but I am curious if it is common practice or even permitted. I know that uh, ecumenism or ecumenism is part of our mission, but there are established limits on how to interact, or are there established limits on how to interact with other churches or faith communities? Thanks, Robert. Thanks so much, Robert, for the thoughtful question. We've A lot of our folks have heard that terminology before, pulpit exchange. But in fact, Robert is so very careful in his own language, and I really appreciated that because he talked to us about how he was invited to go to a Presbyterian church and give a homily, but that their minister was invited to come to their church for mass and give a talk. Mm. So notice, even in Robert's language, he gets the precise difference that we have because we know, again, back to canon law, we know that canon law requires that for the, our Eucharist, for Holy Mass, it is both our teaching, our tradition, and canon law that the liturgy reserves the right to preach to the homily for a priest or a deacon. Yeah. So obviously that's a Catholic priest or a Catholic deacon. Now, the reality is that other ecclesial communities can invite our priests or deacons to preach, and they are welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. But in our, in our faith, of course, as Catholics, only a priest or deacon preaches. However, as Robert points out, anyone, you know, we give missionary talks from different people. They can certainly give a talk or a reflection after the closing prayer, mm -hmm. but never in the place of the homily. Yeah. So I think it's important to say that there are these established limits, and his terminology gave it to us, yeah. which was very helpful. All right, good. All right, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, we're going to go to Candace in Bowling Green. Dear Bishop Thomas, I don't understand uh, why there is such a backlash over North Carolina's law prohibiting people from using whatever restroom they choose. This seems so common sense to me. Uh, what can reasonable people do to combat this type of extremist social activism? Thanks, Candace. Candace, thank you. I, I must confess that I'm surprised that you're surprised <laughs> in this sense. Obviously, you mentioned that you're, you don't understand such a backlash, and then you say, but it seems so common sense to me. I guess, Candace, my first observation would be this whole issue of transgenderism, of folks insisting on bathrooms for fa transgendered individuals. Uh, my dear dad used to say, common sense is not so common. So I think, Candace, my first observation would be, I understand the backlash because we've reached a point that the world is really moving in a direction that is not understandable, nor is it common sense, yeah. simply because of the understanding of our bodies. So I don't understand in many ways, Candace, why, for example, now we recognize, we saw in the press that a 12-year-old boy is saying that uh, apparently a bathroom that would be put set aside for his needs, that in itself is discriminatory. 
which is now leading to laws. And Candace, you need to know that these laws are going to impact, for example, our Catholic institutions, including our Catholic schools, that will have to provide all of these other things because of transgendered individuals. So I think we have to step back from the question of how reasonable is the request. Even we have to step back further, Ron, to the reality of the question is, how reasonable is it to think that people can think that they can change their sex? And so these are not common sense questions. Mm. And really, they're radical questions that are changing the face of our culture. Sure. So the reality is, sadly, that uh, I think the backlash is very understandable given the direction that the culture is going. Okay. All right, good. Thank you so much. Thanks for that question, uh, Candace. And we are going to go to Paul, Sylvania St. Joseph. Dear Bishop, we are fascinated and awed by the recently announced Eucharistic miracle in Poland. And he wants to know if this is approved. Thank you. And I guess I, I have to say, Paul, thank you for your notation. And I'm always grateful, folks, when I learn something from a question that you yeah. send in. And I have to confess to you, I know that this message of the bishop, and I believe this might be, I'm presuming, Ron, this is the miracle that Paul in Sylvania St. Joseph is talking about. It was just uh, put out by the bishop on the 17th of April, 2016. So this is new, new, new. Oh, okay. And so, Paul, you've brought to my attention something I was not aware of, and that is the bishop of Legnica. Now, I'm going to pronounce it that way, but our good okay. Polish listeners, Ron, they may tell me that it's to be pronounced another way. Uh -huh. But the bishop in Poland indicated and has pronounced on a presumed miracle of a host in his diocese in the parish. And fundamentally, I can just share with you what the translation yes, yeah. of his document says. It indicates that after a forensic medical examination, the histopathological tissue, that's what their the terminology, fragments were found containing a fragmented part of skeletal muscle and muscle similar to heart muscle, hmm. which is really rather amazing. And so this bishop says he presented the whole matter to the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome. And Paul, you should know that's exactly where he was to go to authenticate whether or not this was miraculous. And he's saying now, announcing on August, uh, April 17, 2016, he announces that he has received word from the Holy See and he has recommended to the parish priest to find a suitable place to set these relics up in order that they might be appropriately mm. reverenced. So it appears to me, Paul, that that is giving credence to the miracle, which has been uh, presumed over time and now is, is being uh, recognized as an unmistakable miracle and mm. divine intervention on the part of uh, this Eucharistic miracle. When did this occur, the, the miracle, do we know? From what I can see, it was from a host in December of 2013. Oh, so, so it's very recent very and recent. understandable that only now a judgment is coming out mm. after all the, uh, the very critical examinations that had to be made in that regard. Wow. All right. And of course, as our listeners know, uh, over, over history, we do have examples of, of such miracles sure. throughout the world. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, I've got about 30, 45 seconds. Anything final you've got to talk about? Or Thank you. Talk about? One thing I'll mention, Ron, is, of course, I'm going to be attending uh, in the next couple of days the installation of the new Archbishop of St. Paul, Minneapolis, Archbishop Bernard Hebda. And the folks should know that I don't get to go to many of these things. Uh -huh. Bishops are installed all the time. But when uh, I have a personal relationship with someone, yeah. I try to go out of support. Just as folks here might remember, we had at least 40 bishops oh, yes. come oh, for yes. my installation yeah. as the Bishop of Toledo a year and a half ago. So I'll be attending that. Archbishop Hebda is a personal friend. He was originally priest of Pittsburgh. He became the Bishop of Gaylord. He was the coadjutor Archbishop of Newark when he was just named by our Holy Father on Holy Thursday. Mm to be the new Archbishop of St. Uh, Paul, Minneapolis. So okay. knowing him as I do as an excellent and wonderful priest and bishop, it'll be a joy to join the good folks there, to rejoice in him coming to them, and to bring the prayers of the people of Toledo, please God, yeah. to support him and the people in the local church of St. Paul, Minneapolis. Wonderful. Could you give us a prayer and a blessing? Sure, since we celebrated the Feast of the Ascension, let's pray that prayer. 
together. Let us pray. Gladden us with holy joys, Almighty God, and make us rejoice with devout thanksgiving for the ascension of Christ your Son is our exaltation. And where the head has gone before in glory, the body is called to follow in hope. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you, Bishop, as always, for being with us. Thanks, Ron, and thanks to Amen. so many of our good listeners and viewers. And our viewers. We don't want to discount our viewers. We know you're out there checking us out. We're so. deeply grateful. Yep. So, folks, uh, again. thanks for being <laughs> with us, and we'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Corner.